Ms. Rusty Moore, this is very, I'm, I'm so looking forward to this. This cat is one of a kind, man. Hey, there have been a lot of crazy son of a guns in this business. And I love every one of them because that was what drew me to this industry from graduating with 50 kids in eastern Oklahoma and loving championship wrestling from uh, the Cowboy and Leroy every Saturday. God, who knew I'd be, my first broadcasting gig would be with a blind color partner. Think about that. This ain't uh, the cute, glib, uh, witty uh, banter on uh, one of those WWE pregame shows where we're doing a lot of talking and saying shit. <laughs> or getting nobody over. It's still going to be all about the end of the day getting talent over. That's what we do in my role. And so this uh, next award is something I'm excited about because the recipient is by God a one of a kind. Yeah, it's going to be good. And uh, to induct Dr. D. David Schultz with the Men's Wrestling Award at the Colorado Club in 2019 is a very noted and successful author, John Costner. You're next. Haku, I'd like to thank you for the tip about the nervous pee break. I only have a few, few minutes worth of words to say, but I have no idea how long he's gonna go, so. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce to you one of the most feared and respected and dangerous professional bounty hunters in the history of the business. If you went on the lam from the late 1980s through the early 2000s and your face ended up on Dr. D. David Schultz's desk, that is how it's, Scott, that is how it's, I thought it was Schultz, Schultz, right? Okay. Um, Dr. Schultz's desk, there was nowhere to run, there was nowhere to hide. Dr. D tracked down some of the worst scum in the history of crime. Gangbangers, murderers, rapists, sex traffickers, drug dealers, and worst of all, crooked politicians. <laughs> From the mean streets of New York to the back alleys of Puerto Rico to the sands of Egypt, Dr. D found them all and brought them all back to justice. While working with Dr. D in his autobiography, I spoke to several bail bondsmen and women who had worked with him in the past, and every single one of them told me if there was somebody they needed found, Dr. D was the one guy they were going to call. To this day, his reputation and his tenacity made him the bounty hunter of choice, even over a certain reality star with a similar name of Doc. <laughs> Dr. D could chase down and hogtie many fugitives in his day, but he also had a great mind for psychology. He could turn a nervous mother or grandma to his side with tenderness, assuring them it would be much better if their precious baby boy would just turn himself in to him because goodness knows what would happen if the police found him first. <laughs> David was also an outstanding detective, and I can vouch for this one personally. Before we ever met to start discussing his book, uh, Don't Call Me Fake, the real story of Dr. D. David Schultz, David checked me out online. By the time we met face to face, he knew my wife and my kids by sight as well as me. One day he gave me a poster from his appearance he made on October 7, 2006 at the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame before I moved to Wichita Falls. And uh, I thanked him for it and I said, you know, David, it's interesting. October 7, 2006, that's my wedding date. And David just looked at me and said, yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't have to tell you that the skills that made him an excellent bounty hunter are also the same skills he used to become one of the biggest, baddest heels in professional wrestling. From Memphis to Florida to Nova Scotia to Japan to Saudi Arabia, from Stampede to the AWA to the WWF, Dr. D terrorized fans and baby faces alike. He was a force of nature far ahead of his time, a redneck wrecking crew who put on some of the most violent matches ever seen in the ring. The list of opponents he faced in his heyday reads like a murderer's row of wrestling history. Ric Flair, the Iron Sheik, Bruiser Brody, Antonio Inoki, Stan Hansen, Johnny Rods, Abdullah the Butcher, Sergeant Slaughter. I assume he found his way to Cape Cod that day, right? Yeah. If you haven't seen that promo, that's one. Scott, you really should have had some of his talking on the video. I mean, it's great to see him jumping around like that, but you know, we want to hear David talking about going to San Francisco to look for a woman, right? <laughs> David trained with the legendary Herb Welch, 
The man, David says, is the only man he ever feared. Herb brought David into the business the old-fashioned way, teaching him how to shoot before he taught him how to lock up. He would stretch David so far that every night when he got home, he'd have to lay on the horn until his wife Peggy came out to the car, opened the door, and helped him inside. Of all the things Herb taught David, the most important lesson was this. Protect the business. Protect the business for every man in the locker room. Protect the business because that's how you put food on the table for your wife Peggy and your daughter Jessica. Of all the one-on-one -on -one confrontations David had in the business, it was a face-to-face -face with a nosy television reporter at Madison Square Garden that most defines his career. It was the night David fell back on his training and did what Herb Welch taught him to do. He protected the business. On December 28, 1984, David didn't hesitate. When the promoter came to him and told him, and I quote him here, Blast him! Tear his ass up! David did as he was told. He did it for the boys in the back, he did it for his family, and he did it for himself. Many men have tried to expose the business over the years and kept their careers, but David Schultz may be the only man who ever lost his job trying to protect it. For that reason alone, he deserves enshrinement in every pro wrestling hall of fame. His name should be known by every man and woman to ever step in the squared circle. The matches that survive on video hold up to this day, and those unscripted promos he filmed in his glory days are shared every day on Facebook and on Twitter and all over social media. Ladies and gentlemen, you can call him a bounty hunter, you can call him a wrestler, a hero, a heel, a trailblazer, a father, a husband, an entrepreneur, an author. You can call him a rags to riches story, or you can call him a Tennessee redneck for all he cares. Just don't call him fake. It is my honor to introduce the 2019 Male Wrestler of the Year honoree, Dr. D. David Schultz. I'm just that kind of guy. I can do it. I guarantee you. <laughs> Evidence in this envelope will guarantee you it's a deposition from John Stossel. And it proves I never hit John Stossel in his ears. That lying piece of crap. A piece of dog shit. And the only thing you can do with that is let it sit, dry up, pick it up, put it in a bag, and throw it away. But you know, I'm not going to bring it out because a lot of people around here like to say I cuffed him in his ears. The only way I could get him down. I wonder if uh, is Steve Austin anywhere around here? I doubt it. I'd like to get him face to face and see why he says that on national TV on a podcast that I cuffed him in his ears to knock him down. I thought Steve Austin and me were pretty close. Well, I don't think he's as bad as he think he is. And I guess he think I'm crippled or put down, but I still got one good fight left. And the man over there that beat up two truck drivers in Nashville, Tennessee, I was there that night and he did. He beat the hell out of them. One of the toughest guys I've ever known in the business today. I'm glad he likes me. I hope he still likes me. <laughs> I got some more. I'm not going to talk about it tonight because it's, it does no good to talk about it, but I just don't want to bring up a lot of bad memories again. It takes me a long time to forget all this stuff, you know. But, okay. Brian Blair called me and told me he wanted to give me a wrestler award. I said, why would you want to do that? I've been wrestling 40 years. Nobody ever called me a wrestler. And now you want to call me a wrestler 40 years later. He said, well, we want to do it for you. We've uh, decided to do it for you. That's good. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, okay, okay, that sounds good. I need another award. Like, I need a hole in the head. I said, uh, I'll take it. I'd like to come down and help the, the wrestlers and everybody and do what they got to do. But, uh, you know. Now, one thing I want to, I'll skip around a lot, you know, because I got a lot to talk about. And I don't want to keep it growing. I don't want you to keep it here until, you know, wee hours of the night. And uh, now, Jerry the King Lawler over here, he's a good friend of mine. I thought he was a great friend of mine. Yeah, he's still a good friend of mine. We were partners in Tennessee. And, uh, you know, I never hear Jerry tell anybody about the times that I think I saved his life when the guy had a gun stuck to his head in Tupelo, Mississippi, the driver's side of the car. And he said, David, he's got a gun. Okay. I walked around the car and I said, give me that damn gun, boy. Wow. Throwed the gun away. Me and Jerry went on about away. Poor Jerry. Had that gun stuck right to his head. Is that right, Jerry? You remember that, don't you? I didn't think you was losing your memory or anything. <laughs> Another time, Jerry in Memphis, Tennessee, this old big bad boy stopped us outside the gate. Uh, after a match that night, we had so much heat. He jumped out with a baseball bat trying to beat Jerry and his car up and I was behind Jerry so I just happened to have a old rubber hose about that long with a lead pipe in the end. I don't know where I got it or how I got it but <laughs> as I run up Jerry's car this old boy got kind of scared. I was swinging that hose you could hear it going hoo, hoo, hoo. Jerry come running out of the car and I'm hitting this old boy every time he take a step all you could hear wow wow he said, David, you're going to kill him, okay? Is he still there? He threw the baseball bat down, and he outrun both of us. We didn't see him anymore, so that was another good. I could tell you a lot more, but Jerry don't like me. You know, I don't want him to make I don't want him to not like me no more, you know? He's, he's a pretty good guy, and, you know. But, uh, and Sergeant Slaughter's out here laughing, looking at me, smiling at me. Good guy, tough guy. Been in the ring with him many times, beat the hell out of me. I couldn't walk for two or three days every time I worked with him, but uh, he's a pretty good guy. Tony Gurria actually comes up and talks to me every time. This guy, one of the few in the WWF, that'll come on and talk to me. I told him today, Vince might be looking at you, boy, you better watch it. He said, I don't care. <laughs> but you know, uh, people don't understand. I understand and you understand. We all went through the same thing. Man, we all went up and down the road. We did all the bumps and we did all the all the bad stuff, all the good stuff, and everything. I gotta tell you, I couldn't afford a hotel room in, uh, when I first started, and that was the easy way we did to get a hotel room. I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, but we carried a coat hanger in our car, and as we got through in one town, we go to the next town to wrestle and. You know, you had to be careful. You couldn't pay no big money, you know, fifteen, twenty dollars a night, four guys sharing a room. I mean, so we got a coat hanger and we go to the Motel Six, and everybody that leaves like two or three o'clock in the morning, they drop their key in that box. So we go up and get a key out of that box. Oh, look at here, we got a room. Yeah. And, yeah. And when we left the night, of course, we, we, we kept our own sheets with us and towels, you know, we're very clean guys, you know, I mean, four of us tearing beds down, two of them sleeping on, uh, one sleeping on the floor here, one sleeping on the box frame, oh, 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 my God, that was an awful, awful scene, but you got to get some rest, you know, every once in a while. But, you know, a lot of guys come up here and they talk about, hey, this, uh, I mean, uh, everybody asks me, what about the WWE, WWF, hey, you guys work hard, you do a hell of a job, you're just like everybody else. I have nothing against any of the wrestlers that uh, work with the WWF. They all got to make a living. They do a good job. I had to make a living too. Well, I was put out on the street from the WWF. They tried to take my house from me. Vince McMahon did. He put a lien on my house and my property in three states for me doing what he asked me to do, or what I thought he wanted me to do. And he told me I did a good job at it. 
But I, the, the, the story is here, he tried to take my house and put my wife and my kids out on the street. And I didn't have one wrestler, not one. Nobody in here, not even you, Jerry Lawler, call me and say, David, can we help you? Is there anything we can do for you? Do you need anything? You put out in the street, Connecticut, very expensive place, just bought a house. A kid in high school, I'm not moving again. So, never had none to it, not one. Not one. And I could all care about if you did or didn't, it would have been nice to hear from you and say, hey, are you okay? Are you living? Are you, you know, uh, no, no. But I understand why. Because if he had heard that anybody called me or talked to me, they would have lost their job. That's the way I feel about it. Uh, okay, I'm in Connecticut. I have to make money. I went to a bondsman that they had a motorcycle guy nobody wanted to go pick up. Super badass. They said, pay, pay, pay me good money if I could find him and bring him in. They've been looking for him three or four months. And I got the details and all that and went looking for him. The next morning, I picked him up about nine o'clock in the morning. He, he wasn't that bad, you know. He walked around the corner, I stuck a nine millimeter in his mouth. And, you know, he wasn't bad at all. <laughs> Took him to jail. And that was my be beginning of the uh, career of bounty hunting. And, you know, I made very good money bounty hunting. And it's a very dangerous occupation. I'm good at it because I was smart. I wasn't stupid, I was smart about them, you know. And I, I learned uh, mistakes all along doing bounty hunting. You know, one of my first guys was uh, in Hartford, Connecticut. One of the first, I'll say that'd be uh, eight or 10 down the road. I seen him, I put a gun in his face and told him, you're under arrest. He told me what to do with that gun. And he slapped my hand. And he took off running. And I'm sitting there holding the gun, I'm going, I'm not running after him because he looks like uh, Star Wars, warp speed going. I was like, ain't no way I can catch this guy. I couldn't even shoot him if I could, you know. So from that day forward, I didn't hunt with too many guns exposed. I kept them in my coat pocket because, you know, you had to deal with the families, you had to deal with the kids, you walk in the house, you pick the guy up, take him out. The woman calls the cops and says, hey, he drew a gun on my kids and threatened my kids. And, uh, you know, no, I, I drew the gun out because your husband was asleep on the bed and I pulled him off in handcuffs and there was a 357 Magnum under his head. He told me I didn't know where I got there. It wasn't mine. Uh, if it ain't yours, then it's mine, right? Yeah, it ain't mine. I don't know nothing about it. Called, called the DEA, turned it over to him, and uh, you know. But there was some very funny stories too. You got a few of them in the book. I hate to, uh, you know, tell you about them, but uh, you know, there was a lady, or oh, a lady, no, she wasn't a lady. She was a female, uh, I think. <laughs> the <laughs> bondsman called me and said, David, we gotta have this girl in, you got one month, if you can't get her in, we gotta pay $125,000. We need her real bad. I said, okay, I gotta put out a big reward, hoping some of my informants would tell me where she's at. So I put the word out, got a call, one informants, and they said she's over there in that drug house. And I got one of my boys with me, put him in the back door, went in, all these guys sitting around with needles sticking in their arms, stuff running out of their mouth and all that. I said, where's that, where's she at, man? We'll just use Brenda for her name. Where's Brenda at? We ain't seen Brenda. Ain't no Brenda around here, man. Uh, you know, I said, yeah, she's in this house. Oh, no, she ain't either. No, no. My guy's out back, so I'm searching, looking around the rooms and trying to keep the bugs off of me. I opened the closet up, and dirty clothes was up to about, you know, yay high. Bugs jumping all over the place, so I take my foot and I kind of shake it a little bit, and bugs just started running, and I slammed the door. And I, it just seemed like it was, you know, moving a little bit, the clothes. So I searched a little bit more and asked the guy some more and all that. I said, hey, I know she's in this house. You tell me I, I'm not leaving here and we're, we're going to have a problem. I'm going to call the cops. They're going to come over here and get all you got. Anyway, I go in there. Now I kick it pretty hard. 
and it bounces back and forth. You know, I said, ah, oh. she's getting bugs running everywhere now. I'm telling you, kicking the bugs off, you know, I mean, the roaches and stuff. So I tell my guy to come in the house, and uh, I said, hey, I'm gonna check this closet again. Just watch these guys over here, because they all got needles sticking in their arms and stuff. They throw it at you or whatever. I opened the door. I said, I think she's in this closet. I'm gonna try one more time. She rose up out of them clothes, like Godzilla, man. Roaches and everything falling off of her, hadn't washed in six months. And she said, you kick me in my head again, we're gonna be fighting, we're gonna be some fighting MLs, me and you. Uh, I ain't going to kick you, baby. No, it's over, man. You got to go to jail. Hey, put the cuffs on her. Huh? He said, I put the cuffs on her. <laughs> I said, take her down to the jail. Huh? Take her to the jail. I don't want her in my car. <laughs> well, hell, I'm the boss. You got to take her. Put, her. put her in the car and took her down. She still had bugs crawling over. And, uh, you know, you run into that all the time. You just have to have some good bug spray. And, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I picked them up in dumpsters. I picked them up in Cairo, Egypt, Puerto Rico, San Domingo, all these illegal countries you're not supposed to get them out of. I didn't have no trouble getting them out. Um, I was good at what I did. And I, you know, I've been trying to get a TV series going and they want me to do live pickups. You know, they want me to go out there and pick people up live again. Nope, I'm not going to do that because I don't have insurance good enough to do that. Because now they'll sue you if you look at a house crooked, you know. Oh, he threatened me or whatever this is. This is. But it's very good to me. I did it. I'm still doing it. I did some last couple months ago. I did a couple, you know, people pick people up for bondsmen that are scared. Yella. Uh, this guy said he's going to kill me or anybody else comes after me. I know where he lives. Will you go get him for me? Yeah, for ten thousand dollars. Okay. So I mean, he picks me up, meets me, takes me to Alabama, says he's in that house right over there. I said, okay, you go in the front door and get him. I'll go in the back. He said, oh no, 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 you go in the front. He ain't gonna shoot that. You know. So I tell the guy go to the back, put a uh, wedge in the back door so he can't kick the door open and run out the back. I told him just wait on him. If he comes out, if he got a gun, shoot him. But he ain't gonna have a gun, you're just hearing this, you know. I go to the door, he comes to the door, and I said, uh, David Schultz, Bell Enforcement Agent, you're under arrest, grab him by the hair, and do that old wrestling move, take him down, and handcuff him before he knew what was happening. Put him in the car, and he's whining and crying like they always do. I didn't do nothing. It ain't me, you got the wrong guy. Uh-uh, uh -uh. oh, uh -uh. not me, not me, not me. Hey, $10,000 is you, come on. I put him in the car. Put the seatbelt around him. I go in the back of the house looking for the bondsman that I'm picking him up for. He's supposed to be the back door. He's about 50 yards out behind an oak tree hiding. I said, what in the hell are you doing out there? Hell, I don't want your shot. Okay, pay me. Take him and go. Those are the kind I'm doing now. I just pick up the people that everybody else scared to pick up. And I said, why are you scared of these guys? I mean, you know, well, we're bail bonds. Well, I bet I was a bail bondsman too. My wife was a bail bondsman. And we never had anybody get away from us. Well, we don't want to get shot, get out of the business, you know. But I survived, I made it. And uh, like I said, I could talk about a lot of things. Nobody really want to hear about it. But, uh, you know, I had a rough time of it. I made it. My wife's over here. This year we're celebrating our 50 year anniversary. And she stuck by me all this time, all the crazy things that I've done, being the crazy guy I am. You know, everybody's like, oh, he's crazy, man. He ain't got no sense. He's, you know, and, uh, you know, I got pretty good sense. I mean, I went to Poland. Worked for Sikorsky Aircraft for three years, working on helicopters as an engineer. You gotta have some sense to even land a job like that. And I didn't ask for it, they called me. They said, you're pretty smart, ain't you? Yeah, I sure am, how much you paying? <laughs> I loved it too, the contract run out after three years and I had to come home and, uh, you know, I had to retire again. 
living a good life, picking up scumbags, driving tractor trailers, uh, hauling nuclear waste, picking cotton. Oh yeah, I picked cotton. I sure did. My mama did. My daddy did. And when all of them died young, but you know, it's. I still do it. I haul it from the gin to the warehouses, and it's a great job. I only think it's three months a year, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. People, seven days a week? You don't ever get off? No, you don't get off. And uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm just trying to fill in the clues here for everybody to let you know what I've been doing. I'm still around. I'm not dead. I'm in great shape, I think. According to my doctor, the VA, I cuss him out every time I go. <laughs> he tells me he wants me to take this pill and this pill and this pill and this pill. I said, I ain't taking none of that shit. You need to leave here. You're a veterinarian. You're not a good doctor. I want another one. <laughs> Mr. Shields, you can't keep talking to us like that. What do you want me to tell you? You're an idiot. <laughs> I have to come here to get my blood checked every year, free and all that, because VA, you know. And uh, I go back again, I go home, and I'll get some more prescriptions in the mail. I, look, I don't even know what, that, what they're for. I send them back to the VA. And I go back to him, he said, are you taking that uh, blood thinner I give you? No. Nope. Are you taking that other stuff I give? What stuff? That stuff's gonna keep you alive? No. Nope. Were you taking your blood pressure now? No. Nope. I said, what's my blood pressure today? He said, 122 over 72. Why in the hell would I want to take blood pressure? Are you an idiot? Are you stupid? Hey, Mr. Schultz, you got to quit cussing us when you come down. I ain't coming back here no more. Slam the door, you know. Oh, he's got a temper. I'll tell you, he's got a bad, bad, bad. And I mean, that's the way it was in wrestling, too. A lot of guys, you know, they knew they was going to work with me. They said, oh, oh, oh I got to go. I got to go home. I ain't got time. I'm not going over there working with him. He's too stiff. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't ever hear Jerry Lawler say I was, I never heard Sergeant Sloan say I was stiff. I never heard Hulk Hogan say, oh, excuse me. I did hear poor Terry talk about how stiff I was. David, can you lighten up on me? Quit talking about how big my head is. What do you want me to say, Terry? Your head is big, man, it's huge, it's like this. You got a rag on top of it. I mean, he said, yeah, but you ain't got to tell everybody. Every day on interviews, you go out here and you talk. You always talking about my big feet, my big head and everything. What do you want me to say? Well, just quit, you know, uh, you don't need to quit. I said, okay. So I, got, uh, I went out and talked to him. told him, hey, people like you, big head like that, uh, you know, down south, they usually lock them up in a building outside and feed them about once a week. And you're like... I had to give him something to talk about. Hell, he didn't have enough sense to talk about anything on his own, uh, you know. But finally, it, it come down to where he told Vince that I was going to beat him on national TV. I said, you are an idiot. He said, well, you go out there, you're always messing with me in the ring. You're always tightening up on me and you're always doing this, making that, 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 that. You big damn cry, baby. Now, me and this guy used to live here. He lived at our house, me and my wife. He didn't have a place to sleep. He didn't have a bed. He had a van and did not have a place to sleep. Couldn't afford a hotel room. We took him in our house. He stayed in our house. And Florida stayed in our house. We was close. We were very close. And then, all of a sudden, one day, I'm not close no more. Hey, Terry. Terry. Hey, Terry. Damn, he, I guess he's getting hard hearing, you know. I mean, you know. And uh, anyway, well, enough about him. I don't want to give him too much publicity. <laughs> I'll tell you what my wife does, though, when I go to the store with her. Every once in a while, she'll let me go to the Walmart or Sam's or something, you know. I get to walking around the store, and she'll, I'll be in front of her, and she'll say, David, David, David. I hear her. Ain't no way I'm gonna turn around calling me David. Somebody might be looking for me. So now she goes to the door, she says, yo! And about 20 people turn around. I turn around, yeah, what's up? Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny, man. I, I, yeah. but, but anyway, I don't want to bore y'all with uh, 
you know, there's so much you can talk about. But everybody done talked about it. John Cosper talked about it. And then Joyce Grable come up here and I, said, I told her, I said, what am I going to talk about now? And then Haku and them, they come up here, they, they, they told everything, man. I'm, I, they took all my lines. They must have got my notes back there or something, you know. But I didn't want to say nothing to him because that's one guy I'm scared of. <laughs> so I appreciate it and I'm going to tell you, even though uh, you may think I'm, uh, I'm an asshole and I don't care. You may think I'm no good, I don't care. You may think I don't know how to work, I don't care. You may think I'm a piece of shit, I don't care. But I'm so surprised at getting a wrestling award. Never got one before. You know? I appreciate it. Call Cloudy Club for doing a great job. I like you guys. I signed more autographs and took more pictures than I ever did. You know, and done. I got flashes. Oh, they don't use flash bulbs no more. I'm sorry. Thinking of back, way back, you know. And uh, I'm looking to be back next year if they'll help me back. And uh, you know. Thank you very much. You come up here and cuss some more and talk about your pissing and talking about your beer and all that. I never, I never knew you, but I, talked, I heard about you and seen you. But you seem like a pretty nice guy. I know I'm better redneck. I, I gotta go. I'll meet you, man. All right, bro. Yeah, all right. All right, man. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. He's a real heel. He knows how to be a heel. He don't mind being a heel. He's a pro wrestling